Welcome to Ciencia and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Jim Pomerantz, Professor of Psychology and Director of Ciencia, and this is our Ides of March lecture, uh, the seventh lecture of the academic year uh, in a series we hope you're finding educational and enjoying, if not grisly, a series whose theme is conflict, violence, and war. Uh, we're fortunate indeed to have as our speaker today a widely known and widely admired member of the Rice uh, Psychology Department, David Schneider, and it will be my pleasure to introduce Dave in just a moment. Uh, but uh, as you all know well by now, our theme uh, this year of conflict, violence, and war was developed by a faculty committee led, as you all know, by uh, David Queller this past year. Uh, we are at, always looking for suggestions for themes in future years, so by all means, uh, take a moment if you have a moment and uh, send your suggestions our way, either to me or Ellen Butler, uh, and uh, we'd be happy to, uh, to, to look them over. The theme this year, uh, you, most of you have heard it, so I won't spend time uh, uh, dwelling on it, but we've been looking at conflict uh, in, human and in an humans and in animals. We've been looking at present-day conflict, uh, conflict historically. We've been looking at conflict between individuals and conflict between groups. So today we get to hear a psychologist's take on the uh, matter. Uh, following Dave's talk this afternoon, uh, we'll be concluding our schedule for the academic year on the evening of April 19th with our much anticipated Bachner uh, lecture right here in this room starting uh, at 8 p.m. As some of you know, perhaps most of you know, the Bachner uh, uh, lecture always features a speaker from outside of Rice, uh, but this year our speaker is in some ways an insider because it's none other than George Rupp, who was president of Rice University from 1985 to 1983 and a colleague and friend, of course, to many people in this room. Um, I think, as most of you know, when George left Rice University, he went to Columbia University, where he became president. And when he stepped down from that post, he assumed the presidency of the International Rescue Committee, uh, which is an organization, a relief organization, that provides uh, assistance to victims of uh, violence, uh, political violence and conflict uh, around the globe. So the Bachner, uh, again, will be our concluding event uh, of the academic year, and we'll all have to uh, wait out the Houston summer for Sciencia to resume uh, in the fall. Uh, so what that means is that the very last word on the matter of conflict, violence, and war will not come from a psychologist, but from a scholar of religious studies. Uh, before I introduce Dave again, let me just note the format. Dave will talk for the usual 60 minutes. Uh, he's got a lot to say. We'll see whether he can uh, squeeze it down to that period of time. Uh, then we'll have questions and answers with microphones, and uh, we'll follow it all with a reception of food out in the foyer. Uh, and now to introduce our speaker for today, Dave Scheider uh, from the Department of Psychology, a department that many regard as the finest at Rice University, especially, <laughs> especially those of us who were in that department. Uh, by way of formalities, uh, Dave uh, received his bachelor's degree cum laude from Wabash College in 1962 in philosophy and psychology, uh, and then went on to receive his PhD in 1966 from, in social psychology from Stanford University, which is widely regarded as the top psychology department in the country, after Rice's, of course. I uh, then became an assistant professor at Amherst uh, College from 66 to 71, uh, took a sabbatical at Stanford. Dave just seems to keep bouncing back to Stanford, uh, can't say as I blame him. Uh, then a position at Brandeis University from 71 to 75, then UT San Antonio, and uh, we attracted him to Rice in 1988, where he's been, with the exception of, uh, of leaves of absence, uh, since 1989, I guess came in January of 1989. To give you some idea of Dave's standing in the field of psychology, he served as editor of the journal so Social Cognition. In fact, he served as editor of that journal for 12 years from 1980 to 1992. So uh, David is either incredibly durable or incredibly stubborn. I don't know which. Um, social Cognition is one of the main journals um, in the field of social and personality psychology. And Dave served as editor during a period, uh, in a period during which that subfield um, came into its own, so it's fair to say that Dave Schneider had a major role in shaping the field of uh, uh, social cognition, and that, in fact, was one of the primary reasons that Rice was so interested in attracting him here at that time. Uh, his research interests are broad and encompass categorization, compound categories, traits, attributions of responsibility, perceptions of stigma and bias, racial categorization, and thought perception, uh, thought suppression, rather. Some of you may have read uh, the coverage in the media on the so-called uh, don't think of white bears phenomenon, uh, 
a research program he carried on with uh, Dan Wegner now at Harvard. Uh, Dave is the author of a recent and highly regarded scholarly volume called The Psychology of Stereotyping, published in 2004 by Guilford Press. He's the author of four other books, including a major textbook entitled Introduction to Social Psychology. He has two more books in the pipeline, one on social concepts uh, and one on a history of social psychology. Beyond those uh, five books, he has uh, uh, over a dozen, over two dozen chapters and journal articles, uh, including several in the top-rated journal in the field, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. While on the topic of stamina, I should mention that Dave is also our department chair for six years, from 1990 to 1996, and he's provided great leadership to the university in other ways, including serving as the uh, chairperson for the successful Social Sciences Foundation course in the early 1990s. Uh, he's been a mainstay for Rice's School of Continuing Studies, popular lecturer on a variety of topics, and in fact is one of three faculty who are helping launch the School of Continuing Studies' new Master of Liberal Studies program. Um, Dave is frequently contacted by the media uh, to explain human behavior, particularly when human behavior becomes peculiar. So when people claim to have seen ghosts or claim to have seen UFOs or claim to have boarded UFOs, it seems to be Dave who feels the call. Um, when the Branch Davidians squared off against the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Dave was our guy on the job. So if he can explain that, he can explain anything. As always, let me ask you to turn off your cell phones, pagers, and anything else that beeps so that we can tune in to Dave Schneider, whose title is The Psychology of Violence. Dave Schneider. I just realized I'm supposed to be equipped with uh, some more electronic stuff. We're getting more electronic stuff in this room. There won't be room for people, but that's another one. Another story altogether. And I'm told it has to be turned on. There we go. So, well, that's going to happen. Um, so what I want to talk about today is the psychology of violence. And there are several levels of analysis that I want to go through. It's my considered opinion that one can't study the psychology of violence without also studying cultural effects and biological effects. So I'm going to spend a fair amount of time, particularly on biology, uh, some psychological considerations, and then what we might call cultural factors. One extremely important fact about violence is that it has a very low, what psychologists call base rate. Uh, we can use a more informal term. It's just rare. And it's rare even among people that you would think might be violent. So I'll talk about that in just a few moments. It's universal. It's seen among all primates and mammals, in fact. Um, it's overwhelmingly male, certainly in human populations and in most uh, animal populations as well. And it's overwhelmingly committed by the young. And I'm going to try to explain, among other things, why those are the case. First of all, violence is rare. It's rare even among violent people. If you look at gang members, for example, people that in our society we would regard as being among the most violent people, they're actually very rarely violent. Uh, they may go for weeks without committing a violent act. They may talk about it a lot. Uh, they may act like they're going to be violent. They may preen and thump their chests and things of that sort. But actual violent behavior is comparatively rare. There are, two there are many applications of this, but two that I want to emphasize today. One is it's hard to observe and easy to miss. And so there are many legends around about uh, different peoples around the world. For example, Margaret Mead, when she did her field work in uh, Samoa, claimed that the Samoans were extremely nonviolent. She was there, I think, two or three months doing her field work. We now know that the Samoans are among the most violent people. In fact, their murder rate is some something like four or five times the murder rate in the United States. Uh, she just wasn't there long enough and certainly wasn't in the right circumstances to observe it. Similarly, as uh, many of you know, there's recent data on uh, the great apes, particularly chimpanzees, and in the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen uh, quite a bit of violence among those animals that we didn't know existed before. So that's one problem, and that comes up in a variety of ways that I'll discuss from time to time. Another 
thing that I think is extraordinarily important is low base rate behaviors must have multiple causes. In fact, all human behavior has multiple causes. There's nothing any of us does that doesn't have psychological, cultural, biological, et cetera, causes. But particularly for low base rate behaviors, uh, such as violence, you must always think about the multiple causes that enter in. So for example, when the Columbine thing came up, I did get contacted by, I don't know, half a dozen or a dozen media <coughs> People, and it all started, nobody ever quoted me because the conversation went like this. Isn't it true, Dr. Schneider, that the root cause behind this is that the parents weren't monitoring their children? Well, that's part of the problem, but there's other things to consider. Isn't it true, Dr. Schneider, the problem is that they had easy, easy access to guns? Well, yeah, that's part of the problem. If they hadn't been able to get guns, they wouldn't have shot anybody, but that's not the only problem. Well, isn't it true that the problem is they were depressed? Well, yeah, that's probably part of the problem, and so on and so forth. There's about six or eight, if I had time, six or eight or even ten things that contributed to that that are, are obvious and probably lots of things that I don't know about and other people don't know about. So we have to always, when we talk about violence, think about many, many aspects of it. And any time you find people saying the cause of violence is fill in the blank, you can automatically dismiss it because they're leaving out about 95% of what goes on. I'm going to talk a fair amount about violence data today. And the data mostly come from the Uniform Crime Reports collected by the FBI every year. These are available online. Uh, it makes, well, I don't know. For me, it makes for interesting reading. Probably most people wouldn't find it all that interesting. But uh, these are data collected. They get them from police departments around the country. Um, so even Rice is there. If you want to find out how many murders there were at Rice last year, it's right there online. Uh, last year, none. As far as I know, never, but that's neither here nor there. But they do report all kinds of crimes. There are seven and eight index crimes they report. Four of them are considered violent crimes, which include murder, aggravated assault, which are basically murders that don't work, um, armed robbery, and rape. The problems with the Uniform Crime Reports, as anybody knows that's ever studied these things, are that most of these crimes are dramatically underreported. Uh, rape, notoriously so, even things like assault, you know, you go out and hit your brother-in-law, he probably isn't going to go, your mother-in-law is probably going to say, please don't go to the cops and report this. We know that most of these crimes are way underreported, that's one problem. And the second thing is, because the clearance rate, what the FBI calls the clearance rate on these crimes is very low, we often don't know who the perpetrator is. Murder is nice in that regard because uh, it's not underreported by and large. There may be a suicide that gets recorded as a murder, vice versa, and you know, somebody goes missing and doesn't get recorded. But by and large, we know who gets murdered. And at least in somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the cases, we actually know who the perpetrator was. And in another percentage of the cases, we know basic information about race and age and things like that because they're witnesses, even though they don't know the exact person. There are also victimization surveys, which are done by the Census Bureau. I think they're done every two years. Uh, where people are just simply asked, have you been a victim of the following crimes during, I think it's the last year, and people uh, do report this. And you find, as you might guess, that victimization surveys report crime rates are anywhere between 100 to 200, and in a couple of cases, 300% higher than the uh, official FBI statistics. But for reasons I'm not going to go into today, I'd be glad to if you want to ask questions about it. I'm, uh, these uh, victimization surveys are almost certainly overestimates of crime. So the real crime rate is probably somewhere between what the FBI says, probably a little bit closer to victimization. But again, this isn't a problem with murder. In fact, they don't ask people, have you been murdered in the, <laughs> the last year? These are murder rates in the United States by, uh, it says violence rate, but it's actually murder rates for the last uh, 30 some years. And there are a couple of interesting things about this. First of all, it peaked in the early 1980s and again in the early 1990s, and it's been going down. It's come up just a little bit in the last year, but it's basically been going down fairly well for the last, uh, oh, I don't know, since 1993, I guess it is, something like that, for better or worse. Gender is probably the greatest predictor. I often ask people, what's the greatest demographic predictor of violence? Nobody ever, they guess all kinds of things. Nobody ever guesses the most obvious thing, which is gender. 64% of murders in this country are male-on-male -male murders. Another 26% are males murdering females, which works out to fully 90% of all murders committed by males. That turns out to be pretty universal. Almost every society or culture you, you can, where you can get data, and of course in many cultures you can't, but any culture where you get data, you find about a 10 to 1 ratio of, of uh, male to female murders. And again, males are more often the victims as well. 
Why is gender so predictive? The classic <clears throat> social science answer, of course, is it's cultural, it's socialization, it's something that people have learned. But, of course, males are more violent in all societies, in all cultures. It's also true of primates, almost all primates, with maybe one or two exceptions. And it shows up early in development, not violence per se, but aggressiveness and assertiveness and things that turn into violence show up as early as one and a half or two years of age, probably before most parents have started uh, training young boys to be violent. So I think that this suggests, certainly, that there's at least some biological involvement in this. And that does not mean, as I'm going to suggest, that culture is unimportant. And I'll talk about that downstream. Another important predictor of violence is age. Uh, if you can understand this chart, in the vulnerable ages, which are roughly 15 to 24, as you can see, the I guess they look they're yellow. I guess they do look, they look white on my screen, but yellow. Uh, you can see that the rate of uh, violence these are murders by the murder offenders uh, are significantly higher than the general uh, population of those people. And one interesting thing is if you look at this right here, you see that there's a larger number of people in the 35 to 45 sort of age range in that vicinity than the younger people. If you push that back to the early 90s when these people were in the vulnerable age range, that probably accounts in part for why there was such a huge jump in violence during the early 90s. This is controversial, but my reading of the evidence is that if you take out uh, age effects in violence, that those curves that you see, the, the ups and downs, tend to disappear. Uh, in fact, most people agree that between 25 and 50 percent of the variance in, um, in murder rates over time is due to how many people are in the, what I'll call the vulnerable cohort, which is the young, young folks. Again, why is age so predictive of violence? Again, the standard answer that most social scientists would give, I think, is this culture and social pressures. Uh, young people tend to be more alienated. They tend to have less family involvement. They're not married. Uh, they may or may not be living at home. They tend to have low income and education and so forth. So these are kind of standard sociological, psychological explanations. But again, this pattern is universal. You find it in all societies. You find it among animals as well. So again, this suggests that there might be some biological involvement, and I'll be discussing that again. I'm going to talk about race just a little bit. I'm not going to talk about it in any detail. I think to leave it out misses an important point. But I don't think that race has the same kind of explanations as age and gender do. But as you can see, black on black murder is about, well, black, blacks commit in recent years about 52, 53, 54 percent of all murders in the United States. Uh, most murder tends to be intraracial, that is, African Americans kill African Americans, whites kill whites. And of course, there's been a great deal of uh, bruja about that and how to explain it. It certainly is not about race per se. I mean, I don't. If, if you think it has anything to do with biology or the color of someone's skin, it, it clearly doesn't. Again, you find in all cultures where there are status differences, where some group is discriminated against or has lower status, you universally find that that's the group that commits the most violence. You find it throughout Europe, for example, the uh, mostly Southeast Asians in. Uh, uh, the Netherlands, for example, the Turks in Germany, and so forth. You find this in, in almost all European cultures and in other cultures as well. So it's not race per se. It is something about being discriminated against, something about being put down by the larger society. This is correlated with poverty, although the effects of race do not, generally speaking, entirely go away when you take out poverty effects. That is, you still find it when you correct for poverty. And again, there's usual explanations, alienation, discrimination, and so forth. And those are important. But I'm going to talk about some other variables down the road that probably play into this as well. The poverty connection, again, is somewhat controversial. Some studies find that poverty is highly correlated with uh, violence. Other studies find less correlation. Depends on what kind of corrections you do. Obviously, if you do corrections for things like homelessness and education and things like that, all of which are correlated with both violence and poverty, you tend to reduce the effect somewhat. My own take on it, for what it's worth, is that poverty is a contributing factor, but probably not as important as some of the other factors that we've been talking about. And again, some of the other things that enter in when you consider poverty are things like mobility and disintegration of the community. Communities in which people are moving in and out a lot tend to have more violence. Social ecology, which is something I'm going to be mentioning quite a bit. And social, by social ecology here, I mean the fact that if you live in a violent community, you have to be violent to protect yourself. 
So the violence feeds on itself in certain communities. Attitudes toward violence, again, you find in certain communities, particularly but not exclusively in, in less affluent communities, attitudes toward violence are more accepting. And we know that parents of lower class kids tend to raise their kids in somewhat different ways on average than do middle class parents, and some of those ways impact uh, violence as well. Again, to be discussed later. Just some other things that might be of interest to you, murder circumstances. The FBI basically divides murder into two kinds of categories, what they call felonies. This would be murders that occur at you know, your local convenience store or uh, during a rape, something of that sort. And other kinds of murders, which I, I don't think this is the word they use. I've forgotten the word, but I call argument-related murders. And as you can see, argument-related murders are higher. Those are the white parts of the bars. And as you can also see, fully 45% of all murders are committed by an acquaintance, another 30% or so by spouses or partners or family members. The other category is things like coworkers and things of that sort. And then there are a certain percentage, about 25% committed by strangers. Now this is, I hasten to point out, obviously only the murders in which we know who the perpetrator is. There's 35% or so murders that we don't know, and that may alter those statistics. But I think everybody agrees that most murders occur uh, with people that you know. And probably the best way to avoid a murder is not be married or live with someone who owns a gun. Which leads me to the next point, which is in this country about 52 to 53%, 55%, let's say, rounding off. Murders are committed by handguns, another 10% or a little bit more than that committed by firearms. And then you have knives, blunt instruments, uh, personal weapons would include shoes and you know, things like that. And other which includes poison and fire and you know, other disgusting things we probably don't want to talk about. So uh, with those kind of facts in mind, and there's other sorts of facts, if you will, that I'll be introducing from time to time. I want to talk first about biological underpinnings, then about psychological considerations, and finally about culture. When you think about the biology of violence, there are several levels that you need to worry about. Uh, I'm going to talk about evolutionary consideration, genetics, uh, neurotransmitters and hormones, and then parts of the brain. I do want to emphasize, I'm going to talk about biology quite a bit. I do not believe, and I don't think anybody who studies this stuff believes that biology is destiny in this case. I don't think that people are programmed by some sort of biological, whether it's genetics or evolution or whatever, to be violent in a particular kind of way. But I do think that to avoid thinking about uh, biological things is to rob ourselves of some important explanatory um, possibilities. I also want to point out something that's very important that I think a lot of people don't fully realize, and I think it's easy even for psychologists to forget, and that is Mother Nature doesn't parse, parse phenomena in the same way that psychologists do. So we talk, for example, let me give you an example. We talk about depression, for example, as though it's one thing. But of course, we now know that depression is many things, it involves probably different centers in the brain, it involves perhaps different genes. It may involve as many as 20 or 30 genes. We don't know yet. Um, so it involves, you know, talking about depression as though it's one thing makes about as much sense as talking about a stomach ache as though it's one thing. You say, I've got a stomach ache. Oh, yeah, well, that's by a lot. Well, yeah, but I mean, you want to know what causes it. Is it cancer? Is it uh, indigestion? What the hell is it? So I, I think that when we talk about aggression in particular, we're assuming, or violence, we're assuming that it's one thing. But biologically, it may be many things. And that's particularly important as we begin to try to sort out some of the genetic and hormonal influences. I'm going to do the simple-minded version, which makes it sound as though we know a lot about this, and we do. I'm leaving out a lot of stuff as well. Uh, but you must remember that, or I hope you'll remember that there's a lot of stuff in here that is a lot more complicated than what I'm bringing out, which is almost always the case when you get into biology. Well, evolutionary considerations. Every known culture exhibits some violence. All primates exhibit intraspecies in violence. And it's found, as far as we can figure out, among early humans. Uh, at least we find skulls that are bashed in and look like they've been bashed in with weapons and things of that sort. They're, of course, not around for interviews, but we uh, do find. So there's all kinds of reasons to speculate that violence might have an evolutionary significance of one kind or another. I'd wanted to talk a great deal about primates, because I've been reading a lot about monk, particularly apes these days. And um, I've had to cut it down, because Jim told me I couldn't talk for three hours. I was willing to give you an all dinner break, but he said that. So I've cut out a lot of this stuff, but let me just say in general that 
most primates, there may be one or two exceptions, but most primates are violent from time to time, especially the great apes, chimpanzees, gorillas, um, orangutans. You find in all these species male fighting. Uh, you find infant killing by males among chimpanzees and gorillas especially. You find violence toward females by males, including rape. It's estimated that something between 30 and 40 percent of all copulations among orangutans are rape by Actually, it's kind of interesting. The small orangutan, the big orangutans just you know, go in and they have their, their female friend. But the, uh, the little orangutans, there's apparently some of the males are quite small, and uh, they tend to rape. And rape is defined by the fact that the, the female doesn't seem to be a particularly willing partner. Orangutans like sex, actually. And apparently, uh, when everything is, uh, is appropriate, the female and both the male and the female act like they enjoy it. The copulation sometimes go on for 20 and 30 minutes. I mean, they're kind of like humans, sort of. Um, and, but uh, there, there is rape. And chimpanzees, as we've discovered through work of various people, now have raiding parties that look like wars and so on and so forth. So again, uh, it looks an awful lot like chimpanzees. Chimpanzees look an awful lot like humans, if you want to look at it that way. And I'm going to talk about some reasons to be suspicious of that in just a moment. There is an exception. The bonobos, who are so-called pygmy chimpanzees, very closely related to the somewhat larger, they're not hugely larger, but somewhat larger chimpanzees. Uh, but the bonobos uh, don't exert, uh, they don't exhibit nearly as much aggression. They do some. Uh, males do fight, but tend to bluster more than fight. Women tend to have a much more controlling, the females, I should say, have a much more controlling interest in what goes on among these societies. And one of the fascinating things about bonobos is that they really like sex, and they engage in it a lot, including homosexual sex, masturbation, the whole repertoire. And uh, they seem, and there's some evidence that, at least among females bonobos, that this is a way of building social bonds and so on and so forth. So, you know, maybe sex is a good anecdote for violence. Who knows? Um, most. Violence in, in primates is associated with breeding access, that is, males fighting over uh, access when the females come into estrus, uh, males fighting over breeding privileges with the, uh, with the female. And also, particularly among gorillas, to a certain extent among chimpanzees, you find uh, the males protecting what I'll call parental investment, by which I mean they protect their own young, the young that they're fairly sure are theirs. And of course, males are never absolutely certain, even among humans. But they are not willing to invest time in the children of another male. So what happens with baboons, for example, is they frequently, a male baboon will frequently take over a harem. Baboons have harems. Uh, will frequently take over the, the women, or the women, the, the females of, the other spe of, a, of another male. And when they do that, they frequently will kill the offspring, the young of, that, uh, of those females that are already there. And in fact, it's estimated that maybe as much as 20 to 30 percent of all infant deaths among baboons are due to males killing them. One of the interesting things about this is when you find one gender uh, competing for breeding access with the other, you tend to get sexual dimorphism, which means that the the, the, the gender, which is almost always males, the gender that's doing the competing tends to be bigger, obviously evolutionarily. If you're going to compete, it's good to be bigger and stronger. And so you, you get that again with most of the uh, primates and certainly with humans. Well, do primate data count? Uh, the evidence is variable. You've got the bonobos. You've got various, uh, these groups of uh, primates do not all uh, be, they're not all violent in the same way, so you can't necessarily argue that it's a, it's a close fit. Chimpanzees are, of course, our closest relative, and they do look an awful lot like humans in certain respects when, they, when you look at their violence. But again, there's ecological considerations, environmental considerations, and so forth, and it would be very hard to complain that uh, modern humans, perhaps even humans in prehistory, actually shared the same sort of ecological niche as chimpanzees do today. That's kind of up for grabs. However, uh, it is likely, it seems to me, and this is a guess, I'd be happy to be proved wrong on this, although probably we never will prove it one way or the other, but be happy to be wrong on this, but probably males are likely to be competitive for one another. Originally, this was probably due to breeding uh, considerations. But if you think about the way evolution works and genetics works, it has to set up mechanisms to work. And probably the mechanism that is most important here is the establishment of, of very large testosterone um, levels in males. 
But once you've established, once you've built that in evolutionarily, so males come with the testosterone producers, it doesn't matter anymore what that's used for. So it'd be very hard to argue that a guy going into a 7-Eleven and sticking it up is you know, interested in breeding privileges with anybody. And in fact, although the fair amount of, of violence does take place over jealousy situations, but it'd be very hard to argue that most jealousy, in fact, or most violence among humans actually looks a lot like it has anything to do with, uh, with sex or breeding privileges or anything of the sort. But once you've set up the testosterone thing, that can be used for other kinds of things. And it's going to be my argument that testosterone is used, uh, is an important part of the, the whole process. There's some cautions. Um, if you think the chimpanzee data are convincing, and many people do, uh, evolution's had plenty of time to work on that. The split between chimpanzees and humans was five million years ago, give or take a million years. That's plenty of time for chimpanzees to have evolved in violent ways and humans in peaceful ways. Uh, absolutely no problem with that. It's also very important when you think about this, we're not talking about any kind of violence imperative or instinct as Conrad Lorenz or Sigmund Freud suggested. Lorenz, in probably the silliest book ever written by a Nobel Prize winning laureate in the middle 1960s called On Aggression, claimed that animals and humans in particular had a sort of an instinct for aggression that sort of built up over time. And when the proper releasing stimulus was presented, it sort of spilled out, kind of a very hydraulic model, very much like, a sex, very much like Freud talked about it as a, sort of an analog to sexual arousal. Uh, it doesn't work that way, trust me. I mean, whatever else I say today, it, that doesn't work that way. There's no evidence for some sort of instinct like that. There's no evidence for arousal arising like that, and so on and so forth. Furthermore, you must always take into account the fact that there are individual differences among males, dramatic individual differences. Most males in this room have probably never committed a violent act in their life. And in fact, I haven't seen one since I was in high school, because I hang out at all the right places. But um, you know, you just it just doesn't happen that often. And we always have to understand that these things have to have situational interactions. There has to be something in the situation that keys this off. So at best, I think the primate evidence suggests we have the potential to be violent without necessarily proving much. Evolutionary psychology, which is a big, big deal these days in psychology, threatening some parts of the world to take over psychology, I think make several predictions based loosely on environmental considerations and sometimes very tightly. Uh, among these are that males should be more prone to violence uh, for all the reasons that I've begun to suggest, particularly against other males and when young, because when males are young, it's when they're most concerned, when their testosterone is highest, when they're most concerned with uh, the kinds of issues that males are supposed to be concerned with. Group status and pride should be most important to males, so you find males should be particularly interested in dominance and power, which they are. You should find that jealousy over females should be in a very important cause of violence among males, which it is. And you should expect to find that males spend an inordinate amount of their time impressing other males, which they do. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever been in a high school locker room, male locker room recently. I haven't, but I was once in one when I was that age. And I was always impressed by the extent to which, you know, the sort of this kind of thing, just go, maybe, maybe female, I don't know. Maybe females do that when they're in the locker room too. But, Males spend an awful lot of time trying to impress one another with how big their shoulders are, how broad their chests are, how much hair they've got on their chest and legs, uh, what a big car they've got, all of these kinds of things. And again, that falls out very nicely, I think, from this kind of model. Furthermore, and this has been perhaps the most controversial prediction, is males should be much more likely to kill non-relatives than relatives, and they are. They're much more likely to kill live-in companions than they are wives, for example. Well, that's not a blood relative. When they, kill their own, when they kill children, they're much more likely to kill stepchildren than their own biological children. And this, I mean, it's like 70 times more likely with the very young. These are data by Daly and Wilson. Some of you may have read that book. And it's an extraordinarily good book called, I think, Homicide, um, in which the first people really to look at what happens within families when people murder. And males do tend to murder more even than females do tend to murder stepchildren. Now, look, there are lots of reasons why that might happen. Children of age two can be very irritating, even if they're your own. And if you come into a family and are confronted with a bratty two-year-old, um, you know, it may not be the best recipe for getting along. Some of you may have had that experience. Um, 
it isn't easy to get along with somebody else's children when you haven't had a hand in raising them, haven't bonded with them, if you want to put it that way, from an early age and so forth. So this doesn't necessarily prove anything biological, but this is an extraordinary, I don't know of many results in social sciences that are as strong as this. So again, the result is below the age of two, if uh, males murder children, they tend to murder stepchildren as opposed to their own children, which again, I don't think I have to take you through the logic on the evolution on this, that they share genes and so on and so forth. A nice little cartoon which illustrates the whole thing, I think, at least about males. Genetic evidence. We don't have much genetic evidence, actually, um, <clears throat> partly because, because it's such a rare event. You like to have to do the gene stuff right. You like to have identical twins and, and paternal twins or monozygotic and dizygotic twins raised together and raised apart. Uh, you don't have all that many violent twins who have one, you know, have been raised apart. So you really don't have as much direct evidence as you want from twin studies, which is usually the way psychologists do these things. We do know that violence runs in families. We do know that it's more closely related to biological and adoptive parents when you make that comparison. We do know that genetic abnormalities related to neurotransmitters tend to be related to violence. And we do know that temperament impulse control and I'm going to talk later about uh, hormones and neurotransmitters are all related to genetic kinds of things as well. There is no gene for aggression. Um, Mother Nature doesn't work that way. Genes don't work that way. Um, there just isn't. And if there is, are th there are genes certainly, to my way of thinking, that are involved in violence and aggression, but there are probably many of them, and they probably do lots of different things. There are many gene-environment interactions, and I'll talk about some of those in a bit. And there are also probably, most likely, at least for my purposes, what genes there are affect primarily neurotransmitters and hormones. Of the neurotransmitters and hormones, I'm going to talk about two, testosterone and, ser testosterone and serotonin. Testosterone, of course, has two major effects that we all are aware. It determines biological sex very early in gestation, I think about the sixth week or so. And also, of course, kicks in at puberty and makes boys, men, and so forth. Uh, it's, all, it's a hormone, so it has effects in the brain, throughout the body. It circulates widely throughout the body. Both males and females produce testosterone. Uh, testosterone, essentially, it's very close to being the same until adolescence, and then males get more. And this is what the course of testosterone production looks like. So at age 20, it's about a 5 to 1 or 6 to 1 ratio. Uh, and, of course, it decreases over time, as some of the males in this room have realized. Uh, levels of testosterone, the general levels tend to be genetic, um, but they're also situational and health concerns that can raise or lower testosterone. Probably the most famous are winning and losing. Uh, even chess players, when they win a chess match, their testosterone levels go up. Uh, I don't, God knows what happens to football players when they win a game, uh, but, and losers tend to have lower levels, but these tend to be very, very uh, short-lived effects, maybe lasting only a few hours at most. And poor health of various kinds can also lower testosterone levels. Large amounts of testosterone injure the immu immune system, and in fact, the, the single biggest reason why males die, what is it, six to eight years sooner than females do, is because of testosterone. Uh, it affects cancer, it affects heart disease, it affects reckless behavior, which at least when males are young is what tends to kill them. Uh, driving fast and all those things tend to be related to testosterone. So those of us in the room that are kind of proud of our levels of testosterone are maybe paying the price downstream. It also contributes to prostate cancer, that's well known, and various other things. Uh, as I said, generally the effects of testosterone affect men and women similarly, but males have more. But you find almost all the effects I'm going to talk about work equally with males and females. Um, the effects are not straightforward, and that's important to know. So if you get an injection of testosterone, it doesn't mean that you run out you know, robbing stores or anything of that sort. Um, it does affect sexual interest and ability, but not in a straightforward way. Uh, it seems that if you have a minimal amount, that's basically what you need, although very highly elevated rates do tend to make men more interested in sex. And again, it's not an aggressive hormone per se. It seems to be more related to dominance seeking and status seeking, uh, which I'm going to argue play into violence. 
These are data from a book by a guy by the name of Jim Dabbs, a social psychologist who actually recently died. Um, these are men in prison in Georgia, and again, you find level, uh, they measure testosterone, you can measure through spit. So they measure it, uh, and violent offenders have somewhat higher rates of testosterone than non-offenders, or than non-violent offenders, and while they're in prison, tend to be more likely to commit various kinds of infractions. Study done with military men, uh, looking at various kinds of things that military men can do, going AWOL, having a lot of sex partners, alcohol abuse, and so forth. And again, testosterone use, or men who are high in testosterone tend to be more prone to all of these kinds of problems. Excuse me. Testosterone and marital status. Um, people that are married once and monogamous tend to have the lowest levels of testosterone. The highest are people who've been married, divorced, and never remarried. There are lots of explanations for this, but the explanation Dabbs favors, due to some other evidence and seems intriguing to me, is that high testosterone men make lousy husbands. Because, among other things, they also like multiple sex partners. So you find that high testosterone men do tend to have more sex partners in marriages. They're more dominant in all kinds of ways. They have more masculine faces, the, the kind of face I don't have, the square you know, chiseled face with the big dimple in the middle. Uh, I don't know about the dimple, but the square face, we know that's produced by testosterone. They smile less often, both in pictures and in videos. They're more rambunctious and reckless, so if you're looking for Animal House, you find a bunch of high testosterone young men. And an intriguing finding that's never been actually confirmed, I heard about this at a conference, but I, I'm sure it's true, is they do more preening, and this was a study that's never been reported in the literature, so. But the guy reported the effect when uh, high testosterone young men walk in front of a mirror, they tend to preen more. <laughs> Adjusting the chains or whatever the hell they're wearing. Um, so, again, that would make a certain amount of sense given the kinds of evolutionary arguments I've made. Occupations, uh, high testosterone men are more likely to be blue, blue collar and unemployed. Actors and pro football players are especially high, as you might, I don't know about the actors, that's kind of a surprise, but pro football players. Jim was asking about hockey. I'm sure hockey players are high as well, although I don't think they've been tested. Ministers are particularly low. And anybody in a high dominance profession tends to be high. So litigators and among attorneys uh, tend to be high, whether they're male or female. Uh, CEOs of companies, they don't like spitting into cups, but to the extent you can gather testosterone samples tend to be higher than average and so forth. Serotonin. Um, Pretty much everybody knows about these days. It's a neurotransmitter, which means it affects connections in the brain. It's implicated in all kinds of things, primarily emotional features of, of us, and particularly in depression. So we all know about the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is just a fancy way of saying they put more serotonin in your brain. Uh, drugs like Prozac, uh, Celexi, and so forth that are used. For not, you know, I, I, I can't remember all their names. There's six or eight of them, but the Prozac class of drugs. What people tend not to realize is that one very strong component of depression, in addition to being sad and having low affect and so forth, is general irritability. And you find this pretty universally. It's often masked by other symptoms. So if you're, you, know, you go to your psychiatrist's office and you say, I'm thinking about committing suicide, probably irritability is not one of the things that gets noticed right away. But those of us who have sort of low-grade depression uh, irritability is one of the first signs, so mm, family members will report he's angry all the time, he gets upset at little things, that kind of thing. So people low in ser serotonin tend to be highly irritable and aggressive, they're easily frustrated, they especially do impulsive violence, and they may promote what I call, what I'll talk about in just a few moments, called fast track anger. Serotonin levels are again partly genetic, but they can also be affected by extreme environments. So children that have been severely abused as children also tend to have lower serotonin. Actually, they don't have lower serotonin levels. They have fewer receptors, which amounts to the same thing. So when you combine testosterone, high testosterone with low serotonin, you get a recipe for people that are likely to be violent or at least aggressive. You've got the high testosterone, meaning they're seeking status and, and dominant seeking behaviors, which are often reckless, which expose them to more frustration. The low serotonin makes them a particularly subject to 
uh, to uh, frustrating events, and so you get a likelihood of aggressive behavior. This was stolen from a guy by the name of Bernhardt, but it's a fairly commonly used example. By the way, I should say I meant to that these are not the only neural transmitters or hormones that are implicated in aggression. They're just two that are easy to talk about. And the point of this is not that this is the final answer to why people are aggressive or violent. It is just kind of a recipe for the ways that we might think about these kinds of things. Well, I'm not going to talk about culture fully, but I do want to talk a little bit about cultural and environmental influences on things like irritability and frustration. Keep in mind that culture defines for us what status is and what dominance is. What would be dominant in one society isn't dominant in another. One would be high status in one society isn't necessarily high status in another. The same thing with irritating. I mean, there's some things that are just irritating, you know, small pains and things like that. But a lot of the things that at least I regard as being irritating are culturally defined. They're just irritating because I happen to live in a culture that defines them as irritating. Heat and violence, my predecessor at Rice, uh, Craig Anderson, who some of you may remember, he left just about the time I came, has done some wonderful research on heat and violence and finds that heat in general increases violence uh, pretty reliably and actually has gone to the trouble to calculate the increase in homicide rates with global warming. And I can <laughs> give you a reference to that if you're interested. Uh, also, our culture, our peers and things uh, tease us. At least males get teased a lot. The person took advantage of you. You can see this on almost any situation comedy on television. Males being put down because they're being bossed around by females or something has happened with another male and with egging on and so forth. And of course, culture also influences how all of these things get channeled, what are seen as appropriate ways to behave if you're irritated and aggressive. Brain pathways, I don't want to say too much about. Um, one possible, this is not a good diagram. I couldn't get a good diagram. But the amygdala, which is there, I'm sorry, this isn't a very clear picture. The amygdala are two little things about the size of my little fingernail that hang down underneath the brain, part of the limbic system. And they are repositories for all kinds of emotional sorts of stimuli, anger, and so forth. Uh, what happens when the amygdala gets stimulated, it sends, and this is the fast track, it sends messages to the hypothalamus, which sends messages to the rest of the body that says, you've been threatened, you've been made angry, get the hell doing something. But at the same time, there are messages sent to the frontal cortex, this part of the brain here, which is the part of the brain most responsible for rationality and that kind of thing, which then uh, can produce inhibition. And so you've got the fat, what some people call fast track violence or fast track aggression or fast track anger and slow track. Violent men tend to be more prone to fast track reactions. Uh, this will show up as irritability. They have less tolerance for frustration and so forth. They also tend to lack inhibitions. And many people have now found a huge proportion of violent men have frontal lobe abnormalities, in some cases 100%. Um, these could be lesions. They could be just things going wrong. They could be pathways that are disrupted, what have you. Some of this is due to battering. Uh, there's a sociologist by the name of Lonnie Athens who doesn't talk about frontal lobes but talks about battering as being a very important aspect. Could be nutrition and chemicals. Could be genetics. And I hasten to point out that not only do our lovely young males have high levels of testosterone, but their little frontal lobes are not fully developed. And this is, you've probably seen this. It's been in the newspapers quite a bit lately, which is why those of you who have teenage sons pay higher insurance rates and why, among other things, kids that are that age are just stupid sometimes, as we, those of us that have raised children know. Um, that's why kids at Rice drink too much sometimes and all kinds of other things. Kids at that age, there's tremendous individual differences, but a lot of kids at that age are under-inhibited uh, because their little frontal lobes aren't fully developed. Frontal lobes really don't develop well in the pathways between frontal lobes and other parts of the brain really don't develop well until the early 20s. Culture, if you talk about culture and biology, I want to make just a couple of very quick points. Cultures tend to go with the flow. There are very few examples of where cultures actually inhibit or stop something that's heavily biologically driven. What they tend to do is say it's OK to do it, but these are the circumstances under which you can do it. Certainly, that's true with both aggression and sex, for example. So they tend to cha channel things. Also, cultures tend to produce extreme versions of whatever the culture values. So if you have a culture that values religion, you get religious nuts. If you have a culture that values violence, as our culture does, you get violence nuts. No matter what the culture values, you've got somebody that takes it to a stream, extreme and justifies it by saying, hey, 
I'm just doing what the culture tells me to do. So if you talk to violent men, they will tell you, hey, that's what it means to be a man in America. They're just echoing a cultural lesson that they've been taught very many times. So finally, let me talk about psychological issues. Um, probably the way I tend to approach this is in terms of cognitive social learning theory. This is a theory first developed by Al Bandura, who remains the most cited psychologist, although he's pretty much unknown outside the field. Bandura is a simple-minded, most simple-minded, it's an embarrassing theory, actually, because it's about as simple-minded as the theory can possibly be. All he says is that we learn from others about payoffs. Uh, we watch other people. We learn what kinds of behaviors pay off. We also learn techniques and strategies. So for example, I've never fired a gun in my life, but should I be threatened by Jim Pomerantz coming in with me with a machete and somebody threw a gun at me, I presume I would know how to use it. I probably would run. but you know, or cower in the corner or something. But, but should I decide to use a gun, I'm pretty sure I know how to use it because I've seen the same movies you've seen. Likewise, I know how to knife somebody reasonably well, although I've never had occasion to do that. The other part of Bandura's theory is that we act to maximize rewards and avoid costs. And this is going to sound a lot to those of you who are familiar with social sciences, to rational choice theory. It's a little bit different, but for our purposes today, it's essentially identical. Um, People then act to maximize rewards and avoid costs. This isn't necessarily conscious. It's not as though someone who's getting ready to shoot someone is saying, you know, go to jail. I could, you know. But it could be kind of habitual. It just could be the way that someone at some time has thought it through and decided how to act. So this is not rational by some larger criterion of rationality in terms of protecting yourself or staying out of jail or something. But it's rational by the criterion that you are seeking to maximize your rewards and lower your costs. And so that's the way I'm going to be talking about this. The rewards for violence, of course, are different for different people. Money, uh, you can stick up a 7-Eleven, for example, revenge. Image and pride, especially for violent men, this becomes an extremely important factor. Uh, a lot of men rely heavily on their image as being macho or a tough guy. When you interview people in prison, and Hans Toke did a wonderful study, I don't know, 30 years ago now, of violent men in prisons, what he found was that all of these men had what he called self-esteem problems, self-identity problems. Their identities were all bound up with the fact that they were tough guys. I spent some time in the early 70s, I guess, dealing with violent offenders in a prison near Boston. and. Um, it is interesting. I mean, I support what Toke said. I mean, I had several observations about these guys. First of all, they were ugly, actually, which is interesting. Uh, they were dumb as a bag of rocks, mostly. And not just dumb in IQ sense, but just no common sense at all. Um, some of them were reasonably nice. I know they weren't you know, necessarily all bad people. And they just had personality. I used to call them D-minus personalities. They just you know, were sort of vacant. I mean, they just didn't. Now, being in prison will do that to you, so that may be part of it. But, these guys are not guys that have a lot going for them. They're not the guys that are going to go out and get the good-looking babes, if that's what they're interested in doing. They're not the guys that are going to be out able to get a job that allows them to get the great car that they've seen on television that their buddies have got. The only thing they've got going for them is the fact that they've got big muscles. And they're very proud of that. And guys in prison spend an incredible amount of time building up their muscles. And of course, they're not showing off to females. They're just showing off to other guys in the prison population when they do that. And if you've ever been in prison, so that's not a, developing a reputation for being a tough guy is not a bad reputation to have. So these are guys, I mean, the reason I don't have to be violent is if somebody insults me, I can either laugh it off or I use my words or I plot revenge and, you know, plant a virus in their computer or something. I mean, I've got all <laughs> kinds of ways of, of dealing with that stuff that don't require me to use my hands. And in fact, if I did use my hands, I would be beat up. You know, I once got in a fight when I was, I don't know, fourth grade or something and got beat up and I learned a very important lesson that Mother Nature did not tend me to be a fighter. So I learned to use my mouth instead and I'm pretty effective at that. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, these guys don't have that going for them. That all the things that we take for granted as being rewards, they don't get. The only thing they've got is, I'm a tough guy, excuse me. Um, and so they are tough guys. The costs for violence, again, are different for different people. There's legal costs, there's guilt, there's shame, and there's situational form of punishment. Somebody's going to hit me if I try to be violent toward them and so forth. And again, these are different for different people. 
Part of the problem in our criminal justice system is that the people that make the laws assume that what would deter me from being violent or what would deter a legislature is the same thing that deters a young guy who's interested in thumping his chest. And it doesn't work that way. I've spent enough time in prisons that I would do almost anything to stay out of prison. Okay? And except for visiting, I've never been. But these guys, you know, it's just not that big a deal for them. They don't like it. They'd rather be on the outside world, but it's just not that big a deal. So that kind of cost that we take for granted is just simply not a cost for a lot of these fellows. Personality correlates of violence, if you want to go that route, uh, not a surprising list. They have low impulse control. They have low intelligence, poor school performance. Average IQ of violent offenders is around 85, which means that they can hold down a job, but they're not going to be making a lot of money, probably. Uh, they tend to be irritable, uh, they have low self-esteem, and they have what's called oppositional temperament and blaming others for their problems. And so you see that a lot in prisons. I mean, if you go deal with prisoners, I mean, it's very hard to find a prisoner that will admit what he's done. I mean, even if he admits that he killed his wife, because it's obvious he did, he will say it was her fault. I didn't mean to do it. She was nagging me all the time, etc. Cognitive correlates. Uh, violent men tend to see more situations as threatening than the rest of us. They tend to think that the proper response to threat is aggression. And this is learned at home and through peers. It's dysfunctional environments that teach them these lessons. Um, just all, I could give you some examples, but we're running out of time, so I won't. Child rearing and violence. Aggression is stable from childhood on. It's one of the most stable human characteristics. Uh, we know that the following things contribute to violence, abusive parenting. Authoritarian and inconsistent parenting, and that's not the same thing as saying authoritative. Authoritative is providing structure for kids. Authoritarian is, you know, it's my way or the highway kind of thing, or I'm going to beat you if you don't behave. And often authoritarian parents are also very inconsistent. Unrealistic expectations for the child. Uh, father absence is a big variable for whatever reason. There are many, many reasons for that. But uh, father absence turns out to be a, a fairly significant correlate of this. Lack of monitoring of children shows up in all kinds of studies that have been done. If you don't know what your kids are doing, it's a bad sign, it turns out. And that's not just true for antisocial behavior. It's true for a huge range. It's true for drug abuse. It's true for all kinds of things. Uh, don't mean to be preachy, but parents need to know what their kids are doing. And of course, in the family support for violence and deviance, you go out and beat that other kid up. He made a fool of you, that kind of thing. This is one model. I stole this from a developmental psychologist by Gerald Patterson. One kind of model. So you have poor parenting, producing child problems, which leads them to be rejected by their peers. It also leads them to do poorly in school. The only friend group they can come up with is some deviant subgroup that's into drugs or stealing or whatever. And they come to a life of delinquency and violence through that kind of process. One thing the developmental psychologists have been emphasizing a lot lately is genetics. Um, the parent-child correlation, so if you find a correlation between some parent behavior and a child behavior, it turns out that if you do the studies the right way, that almost always turns out to have a huge genetic component. So abusive parents have kids that turn out to be antisocial, but that turns out to be partly genetic. That is, the same gene or genes or whatever that make the parent abusive are the very same genes that contribute to the kid behaving that way. There are two models you could use. There are many, but two that are easy to explain. One's called the passive genetic model, which is no influence. You've got a parent that's abusive and a kid that's acting up, and they don't have any impact on one another, just following their genetic pathways. That turns out not to be the correct model. Some sort of evocative model is a more correct one, and that is something like the kid acts up when he's uh, irritated. The parent who also has the same gene or genes for being irritated, is irritated by the kid acting up, responds by being abusive, by hitting, or something like that, which then makes the kid more irritated. And you get these kinds of self-sustaining patterns and cycles. There are other genetic environment interactions which enter in. Genes affect choices of environment. That's one of the things that um, evolutionary psychologists emphasize quite a bit. Genes affect who we hang out with. Or, they affect what kinds of environments we pick. So smart kids want to be read to more, for example. So you find a correlation between how much parents read to their children and how smart the kids are. But that may be entirely due to the fact that children who are smart just want to be read to more. And in fact, that turns out to be the best explanation for that, as it turns out. So boys who have a genetic propensity for violence may pick peers that reinforce this. And in fact, they do. Parents who share a genetic predisposition with their sons for violent behavior may encourage violent behavior, and the kids, in turn, are all too happy to be violent. 
Another one that I just read, thanks to my colleague Jim Dannemiller, who can't be here because he's at PNT today, which he says is much more boring than listening to me. Um, this is a study published a few years ago in Science. A particular gene, MLM, I'm not going to, because of time, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but it's a gene on the X chromosome that regulates neurotransmitters, including serotonin. Boys with low uh, activity on this particular gene show considerable effects of abuse on antisocial behavior. So the more they're abused by their parents, the more antisocial they become. Boys who are high in this particular gene activity show almost no effects of parental abuse. And this fits with what, what's been a mystery for a long time, and it's just a mystery to all of us, is why some people live in horrible environments and basically turn out OK, and many kids who live in pretty bad environments turn out to be not so good. So again, this is a, a, a gene that affects in some way how people respond to the environment. I want to emphasize peers, again, that are crucial in this. Uh, we've been much too focused on parents in our society. Psychology has. There's a, greater recognition now among psychologists that peers are very important, and not just for adolescents, we all know that, but for younger kids as well. You know, kids, and I've got grandkids in nursery school and school, and they're enormously, peers are enormously important to them. And so, of course, peers reinforce various kinds of behaviors as well. Finally, I don't have too much to say about culture, because I've talked about it a little bit before, but cultures do differ in a lot of ways. They do tend to amplify certain biological tendencies. So yes, men are biologically predisposed to be more violent than females, but that gets a huge boost from the culture in, as well, because the culture does the easy thing, which is go with the flow in terms of what biology presents itself. Uh, the Yanomomo, who are famous, it's a group in South America that are enormously violent. And again, the ecology of violence. One of the things you find with the Yanomomo is that they can't afford not to be violent. Because if you're not violent, you don't get a wife, you get beat up, uh, all kinds of bad things happen to you. And of course, we saw the same thing in the Balkans. We see the same thing in the Middle East. We see it in all kinds of places where violence spirals out of control. Very quickly, the United States, and this is data from the 1980s. I couldn't get more recent data, but the United States is certainly the most highly violent country that we'd want to compare ourselves with. These are data over time for European countries. And again, it doesn't matter who the other countries are down at the bottom. It's a sample of European countries plus Australia. The United States is way off the continuum in terms of homicide. Not necessarily in terms of other violence. In fact, England now has more armed robberies than the United States does for whatever reason. So, so American culture does have high rates of violence. It's valued for males. Um, the media is very important. Television does have an enormous impact on violence, as do video games. If any of you have ever played or seen your kids play these horrible video games, which I actually kind of enjoy, but they're still horrible. Um, <laughs> They do contribute to violence. It is true that the violence, the, the kids that are affected by that violence are only a small part of the population. So the television industry argues, for example, well, look, it's only 20% of the kids or 10% of the kids that are affected. But guess what? Those are the 10% we care about. I, I don't care about my kids. We didn't let our kids, I had daughters anyway, but I didn't let them watch violent television at all. I couldn't even watch Charlie's Angels, and they still hate me for that because they missed out on some very important cultural lesson that they were supposed to get from Charlie's Angels. But, um, you know, I wouldn't worry if I had sons that watched a little violent television now and again. It's just not a problem. But some kids, it, for it, it is a problem. And so you've got that kind of issue. And it also makes everybody more irritable. There's lots of studies now done that show that when people watch violence, they just get more irritable. Everybody does. Uh, they bitch at one another more and argue with one another more and all kinds of things like that. So it's kind of interesting. Um, one more point about culture, and that is the South is enormously violent. Uh, this shows up again and again and again. It has for centuries. It's been a bit of a puzzle. Uh, let me just take two minutes to explain at least one answer. The one answer is, is heat, by the way. But the other answer is something that's been called the culture of violence, which has been proposed by Dick Nisbet and Dove Cohen. Uh, basic argument is that you have herding economies, uh, you know, where they got sheep and goats and cows, and I guess you don't herd pigs, but things like that. And you can steal livestock. And so what happens in these kinds of cultures is you get a, a culture of honor built up where everybody has to trust one another. That this was common in Ireland and Scotland in particular. And the southern United States were settled by these people uh, and others as well. But, but this, so we have a culture of honor in the south. 
The predictions from this theory are that southern whites should be more violence prone, but only males, only whites, because blacks aren't part of this cult, you know, the honor culture. Only those living in smaller communities. If you live in Atlanta, there's too many Yankee imports to make it work. And only for violations of honor. So you find that, again, just uh, one very quick thing. You find that violence-related murders are in the South, argument-related. The South is much higher than the non-South. Where felony-related murders, there's not much difference. And finally, one experiment they did that I think is awfully intriguing. Um, Dick Nisbet's at the University of Michigan, which has a large Southern population. So he did a study in which he recruited kids that had grown up in the South, kids that had grown up in the North, and simply ran a study in which he insulted the kids and then observed their behavior. And the, the insult was, I don't know, let me advance here. I can. Uh, they were insulted. The, the confederate, a confederate, somebody that's a confederate of the experimenter, bumps into the subject and calls him an asshole. And the dependent measure then is the kid walks down, the subject walks down the hall and there's an enormous football player coming at him. And the dependent measure is whether he steps aside and how soon he steps aside. Uh, there's a handshake with uh, another person involved in the experiment. They test how firm the handshake is. And somebody who doesn't know what condition they're in, rate their general demeanor. And you find that, excuse me, you find that in all these cases, when the person is not insulted, southern little boys look just fine. When they are insulted, they move closer to the big guy. They handshake is firmer. They act in a more irritable way. And interesting enough, their testosterone also goes up where the northern kids doesn't very much and so forth. So again, there's a book on this. I'd be glad to talk about it. But I just thought, since we live in a part of the world that is the south. Uh, Dick Nisbet, by the way, is from Lubbock. So I guess he has some experience with violence. Uh, but um, it's, uh, it's an interesting set of, he's got a lot of experiments on this thing. I'll stop now. I was going to summarize some things, but I think I probably the summary probably will take longer than, than it's worth. And I've given you a lot of information, and I appreciate your attention. And Jim will get some questions going, I guess. I was depending on Kleinberg. Come on, Steve. Is <laughs> anybody at Rice that's more technologically less advanced than I am? It's Steve Kleinberg, but go ahead. <laughs> Sociologists say 25% have studied this. It looks to me a lot like, more like about 40%, but there's certainly a lot of residual variants left over. Uh, it could be due to better policing. It could be due to better economic circumstances. Remember, we're talking about the 90s when economic circumstances were getting better. Uh, but it has continued to go down through the times when it's, but maybe the dot com bus didn't affect kids on the street as much as it affects some of the rest of it. I don't have a good explanation other you, than but that. But the age, the age explanation would be one of the ones that you would... Yes, I, I think it's important, but it's not the only explanation, and certainly not even the most interesting one. I just think it's something most people aren't aware of, which is why I pointed it out. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, this, this is working. Yeah. Um, I, too, found uh, your talk fascinating, and I'm not really going to argue with you. I just want to emphasize a point that you stood by. And that's that actually, despite, contrary to, to general impression, the United States today is not a violent society. Uh, that if you take, a, uh, not, if you put homicide to the side, uh, the United States actually comes out about in the middle of uh, a survey of, you know, 100 countries on uh, violent crimes. And in fact, below uh, 
the United Kingdom, for example. You mentioned armed robbery. Well, actually, I think also aggravated assault um, also is higher in Britain yes. uh, than the United States. Uh, and we don't usually think of that. So if you take away one, that one kind of crime, homicide, for which we have an obvious explanation of widespread possession of guns, it turns out the United States is not, as is often always tagged, a violent society. Yeah, and that's important for another reason as well, because violent, there's, I don't know what, 15 million murders, 17 million murders a year in the United States. There's probably 200 million, I've just got 1,000, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> seems like I'm, if you watch television, it seems like 15 million. Um, the, um, but the, the level of assault and so forth is much, much higher than it is for murder. So, you didn't put it this way, but I'm fairly criticized by emphasizing murder because it does distort the violence statistics quite a bit, and that's, that's certainly fair. Um, my reading of the latest study I've seen on the Europe stuff, which was 19, uh, it's the data I presented, I think it uh, stops about 1998, was that Britain is higher than we are in some areas. We're basically higher than every other country, but not by much. Um, I'd have to look at the data to be absolutely sure, but I only presented the data for murder because I wanted to keep it consistent throughout. But no, you're absolutely right that Britain, for whatever reason, I mean, I always, you know, when I go to England, I always think of it as, especially London, which is where you'd expect to find it. I mean, I'm never, I'm never scared any place, but I'm never even scared in New York. But, but uh, as my wife accuses me of being stupid, which probably is true, but um, I'm never, never worried in London or Paris or any major European city. I mean, you stay in the right places, of course, but, you know, I'm not worried here either because I stay in the right places. So, fair, fair comment. Absolutely fair. <laughs> well, there is that. Um, question. Um, since uh, time immemorial, there have been warriors trained in various societies, and warriors are trained to do violence on other people. What's the interaction of that training with uh, the violence in society, if any? I mean, is it the training in particular? For warriors, you know, soldiers. Okay, the, there's a whole training program, and they're trained to do violence under certain circumstances. And, uh, how does that affect societies, if, if, if at all? You know, I, it's a perfectly interesting question. I should know the answer to that, and I don't. Um, as far as I know, and maybe there's people here who, could, who know more than I do about this particular thing, as far as I know, there's been no general increase in violence as a result of the various little shooting matches that we tend to get ourselves into these days. But you do have kids coming back. One of the things I like to point out to students is people say, well, I could never be violent. Well, excuse me. Uh, if people couldn't be violent, then we'd never have wars, right? Now, some of us probably, I, you know, we're all thankful I was never a soldier. The uh, United States government is thankful, and I'm thankful, but uh, probably would have made the worst soldier in the world. But, um, you know, we all are capable under certain circumstances of committing violent acts. If not a war, then, you know, defense or something. So the issue then is when people come back, say, from Vietnam, were there lasting effects of that on uh, violent tendencies? And I do not know the answer to that. So it's a really good question, and I'll actually I'll look it up and let you know. Okay. Um, it's interesting. I'm, yeah. thanks. I, I would like to uh, follow the uh, um, the cultural materialism mm -hmm. interest in, 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 in this, and and that is um, seems to me that um, that the the causes you speak of, the you know. Um, uh, genetics, biology, and culture uh, are real enough, but but it seems that those of affluence and privilege probably don't commit violence as, as much as others. And I would think I would, and I would like you to address that. And secondly, uh, considering this country affluent and, and wealthy, and, and maybe having a decline in violence, I wonder if there's any way to gauge. Um, um, the effect of, of um, say, violence in the third world vis-a-vis -vis this country? Um, first question is easier to answer than the last, um, so I'll address it first. Um, if you think about what parents, what middle-class parents do, and I'm stereotyping, but what generally middle-class parents do, particularly parents of boys tend to spend a fair amount of time dealing with aggression. Don't pinch your sister, don't hit your brother, uh, these kinds of things, and even with girls, uh, you know, you spend an incredible amount of time doing that. I've often taught courses on crime in general, and people will sometimes say, well, I don't understand why all these poor people are committing crimes. Well, you know, 
if you're a single mother trying to work, trying to raise a kid in an environment like that, you don't have time to give all those lessons. It's a full-time job to raise kids. And uh, I think a lot of times it's not because lower class parents are bad parents or they mean to be bad parents or anything like that. I just don't think they don't have the time or the energy to deal with what I see as an unremitting problem. I mean, you just have to keep at it over and over and over and over again. So if you think about conscience, I mean, the reason probably nobody in this room has ever been violent doesn't have a lot to do with jails and things like that. It has to do with roughly conscience. I mean, the, the, most of us would feel incredibly guilty if we, we hit somebody. Um, but conscience doesn't come with puberty. I mean, you have to work at it damned hard, and, and parents do. And again, I, don't, I really don't want to stereotype. I have the greatest respect for the problems that lower class parents, poor parents, particularly single mothers, and to some extent fathers, deal with. I don't want to stereotype, but it's just awfully hard work. And they have much harder work in many respects than middle class parents do because of all the things that I think we know about. That's one thing. The other thing is that middle class, particularly males, if you think about all the ways that we exhibit our dominance behavior and status-seeking behavior, it isn't violent in the sense of going out and beating other people up, but some of the things that we do may be just as bad. Um, uh, probably is inappropriate to get too deeply into politics, but when you've got a president and a secretary of defense who spend most of their time thumping their chest uh, and sending innocent people, as far as I'm concerned, off to war, um, that's a bad sign. You sit in the business world where people are making decisions that affect people, we don't call it violence, and it isn't violence. I think it's important to keep that distinction clear. But uh, I, I think that sometimes those kinds of things, which result, at least in my model, from much of the same sort of biology, culture, and so forth, those things may do as much harm to people as, um, as violence. And that's not, not, not liberal rhetoric. I mean, I think that, that really is the case. Uh, your second question was about, you'll have to rephrase it for me. I've already lost it. I was reaching deep to find it, actually. Um, <laughs> um, I, and I think I'm looking for a comparison uh, based on the uh, assumption that this country is, is, is wealthy and privileged, um, um, which is problematic, I'm sure. But, but is, there, is there any way to look at, uh, let's say, underdeveloped countries and examine their violence and determine how maybe America is doing with regards to improving its violence? Um, well, I think w the problem with violence, like any other social phenomenon, is that you've got multiple things working. Uh, my sense of things, and I'm not an expert on this, is that in many underdeveloped countries, you do have the poverty, of course, and so forth. But you've also got a degree, in some cases, of social integration, which we don't have in inner city neighborhoods and so forth here. You've got family structures existing and so on and so forth, which do tend to inhibit violent behavior. What I think we may be seeing, and you know, I'm there are probably 20 people in the room that know more about this than I do. But what I think we may be seeing with the terrorism coming from the Middle East and so forth is the impact of seeing our lifestyle, which is certainly different from the lifestyle they're able to, to live in terms of affluence and so forth, and therefore being frustrated. I'm absolutely convinced, and I can't prove it, that one of the reasons why the violence rate went up in the, all through the 70s, for example, was the greater prevalence of television uh, and people that, you know, when I grew, I grew up in the 1950s, and we, first of all, I didn't have a television until nearly I went to college. My parents were pretty poor, but, but kids didn't have, to, you know, poor kids didn't have televisions. They just didn't have them. And so you could be a poor kid and never realize that, I mean, you knew there were rich kids out there, but you weren't confronted on a daily basis with what they had. But with the advent of television where everybody sees really quite, I think, extravagant versions of what middle class life is like and so forth, but you see the fancy cars and the nice house with the picket fence and all those kinds of things. It's bound to lead to frustration among those people that don't have those things and have no real way to get it. I mean, they just don't have the skill set to get to that point. Uh, now, that's entirely speculative, and I, I can't back it up. So if that's correct, then maybe the same thing may be going on where television is now moving into not only the Middle East, of course, it's been there for some time, but they're beginning to see more pictures of America, but also Africa and Asia and other parts of the underdeveloped world we may begin to see much more frustration, jealousy-based frustration, if I can call it that. That's not a good word, but something like that. Just one quick follow-up. Sure. Is, there, is there violence and poverty correlations in uh, underdeveloped countries? I do not know. I do not know. 
There's actually been very few studies done on violence in other countries because violence is a tough thing to get a handle on because it depends on reporting. You can do the murder thing, but even a lot of countries don't keep good murder statistics. So it's not like you could go to, I don't know, Botswana or something and, and go to the Ministry of Statistics and get good data on how many killings and assaults there were. They just don't keep those, I mean, I'm assuming. Um, it's hard enough in this country to get good data on these things, and we collect data at every second about everything, it seems like. So it really is problematic to, to make those kind of comparisons, I think. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, the the book you referred to as Silly, the on aggression book by Conrad Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, I take it that the silly part of the book is the idea that there's some fixed quantity of aggression that we all have uh, as a biological inheritance that has to find an outlet. Mm -hmm. But there's a recommendation at the end of the book that uh, might or might not be helpful independently of that. So I'm wondering whether you know of any data on it. So the recommendation is that um, cultures need to provide nonviolent outlets for aggressive yes. behavior, and that will uh, reduce the violence. So what I'm curious about is whether there's any data on um, whether providing nonviolent outlets for aggressive behavior actually decreases violence or increases violence, as the, the example of television might suggest, or both. Um. We don't have good data, but the data we have is that people that watch football games tend to be more aggressive. I mean, we're, it's not talking about going out and murdering somebody. They're talking about you know verbal aggression and those kinds of things, which may not be the same thing as hitting people. Who knows? But um, the the so-called catharsis hypothesis, which is Freud's idea, which is you go hit a punching bag and all your aggression drains away, turns out not to be the effect, the, the case. In fact, there's oh, I don't know hundreds of experiments now that show the catharsis absolutely doesn't work. That's not quite what you were talking about. I mean, you could have other outlets. So if you think about male <coughs> aggression being basically a dominance kind of thing, for example, which is the way I think about it, you could find other outlets for that. And indeed, we do in this society. Whether those outlets are healthy or less healthy or more healthy than the violence they replace is, a, is an open question. The problem with all this stuff is you replace something with something else. It doesn't go away. It just transforms itself. And it's not always clear to me that. Um, the transformation is in our best interest, but surely, uh, <laughs> you know, I think we do that. I mean, I think we do provide, I mean, 15,000 murders is a lot, and the 100,000 assaults or whatever it is are a lot, particularly if you're a victim of one of them, but as Marty suggests, I mean, it's not like most of us in this room just never, never see that kind of stuff. So we do manage to provide outlets, at least for some of us. Um, not a very satisfactory answer to your question. I actually haven't read Lorenz's book for probably 20 or 25 years. I used to teach it quite a bit. Um, the part I object to about the book is this notion that there's some sort of aggressive instinct that sort of builds up over time. It's just absolutely not the case. But he does, it's, it was, it's an interesting book in the sense he has an enormous amount of uh, animal data and everybody likes it because of that. So, but it is, that part of the book, which is the, you know, the heart of the book is silly. But I'm sorry I can't give you a more direct answer to your question. I just don't think there's any good data uh, one way or the other on it. Um, well, I haven't had um, television, literally. I got rid of it 14 years ago. Good for you. And 14. And literally, I have not missed it at all, whatsoever. Yeah. And that, me, my background being a Middle Easterner, originally, uh, this considered really the greatest jihad I've done in my life. And literally, it does not mean holy war. That's a Western misconception. And, and jihad in Arabic means uh, struggle and sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Just like a student, when they struggle hard in school and make good grades, literally means jihad. And in fact, mothers and fathers always call them ishtihad. But I'm, when I come to one point is that the, uh, the self-defense, I don't know how the violence that comes from self-defense, how you uh, compare it with aggressive violence because the, the, most of the violence today in the Middle East is literally, is I consider it, and most of them consider it as self-defense sure. from an outside aggressor who's going in. Uh, I came here 43 years ago. Literally, crimes were very unknown. You could have walked. It, I mean, I remember very well at midnight, pitch dark. We didn't have Las Vegas lights and all that. 
you'd see women, you know, walking by themselves with children, middle of the night, no fear whatsoever, and in dark alleys, in dark alleys of the Middle East. Yet, uh, with the uh, continuous um, Western uh, incursion into their culture, the crime rate is really going up, and that's what they're really against. It's not against America's technology or Western technology or democracy. It's literally, it is this uh, extra baggage that comes with the incursion of current day Western invasion of the Middle East. And, what, so, and what's the current baggage? I didn't quite get The that. extra baggage, meaning uh, crime comes with it, and IMF and the World Bank, and uh, looting their resources, and, and all of that. That's what they're against. It's not against democracy sure. or, or uh, technology or, or what have you. That's well, I'm not certainly far from an expert on the Middle East, but. Um, I think, if I understand your, your main point correctly, I mean that this is a defensive reaction. That, that goes into what I was calling the ecology of violence. I mean, once you get to a point in any society, and we have that in our society, it's just not on the Rice campus, where you have got to be violent to protect yourself in some sense, then you're going to get a, an increasing es escalation of that, no matter where the outside violence comes from. So you see it in Northern Ireland, you see it in, in former Yugoslavia, you see it in the Middle East, you see it with the Palestinians and Israelis. I mean, you can't afford to back down at some level. Just out of maybe interest to you, the animal data, uh, there is something called defensive aggression, which is different both biologic, both in terms of its brain operations and various other things, quite different than other forms. It's quite different, for example, in predatory aggression. So if you look at animal data, you do find that these types of aggression are quite different. Now, whether that informs our discussion about this sort of aggression is, is up for grabs. But um, defensive aggression may look, I mean, it may look, if we did the right kind of brain studies and so forth, it may really look quite different than, than predatory aggression, the kind of aggression where somebody goes out and you know, shoots somebody in a liquor store or something. Just like, um, supposedly, if somebody in, the, in his life and his family's life they have not transgressed on anybody until somebody came in from outside and transgressed on them, and pretty soon it started developing you know, as a reaction. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd really like to see some, if you have enough studies or done in the future for such, such well, events. Don't know yeah. Anything. Yeah. Thank you very much. We thank all of you for coming. Remind you to come on April 19th in the evening to hear George Ruff deliver the Bachner. Please join Dave uh, out in the foyer for refreshments.